Not even 10,000 fans were in the stands in San Diego on the 12th of June 1970 for that evening's double header between the San Diego Padres and the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> All these baseball videos, I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what a double header is. Anyway, let's continue. Doc Ellis, the Pirates starting pitcher for the first game, was in the bullpen warming up. No idea what a bullpen is, as far as I know. That's somewhere where you'd keep bulls. Something was off with Doc that night. He had only arrived to the stadium at 4.30 p.m., a mere hour and a half before the 6.05 p.m. start time. When he did get there, he had trouble locating his locker. In addition, he seemed very confused about what day of the week it was. <laughs> Doc is drunk! As Doc rocked back and forth and began his motion for his first pitch of the ball game in the bottom of the first in a 0-0 ball game, he and everyone else in the ballpark that evening were not aware that this was going to be a game of mythical proportions. Doc Ellis was about to pitch the first and only no-hitter of his career, and he would do it while high on LSD. Oh, he's more than drunk! The story begins with Doc in Los Angeles, about 120 miles from San Diego, enjoying what he thought was his day off. After he flew into San Diego with his team, he decided to rent a car and drive to the girlfriend's home of a childhood friend, Al Rambo. The two of them, plus Rambo's girlfriend, Mitzi, drank, smoked weed, dropped acid, and talked through the night, as friends tend to do. Pretty intense. According to Doc... <laughs> So yeah, sounds like my normal Thursday night. According to Doc, he wasn't even sure if they slept that night. At about noon the next day, Friday, Doc took some more LSD. At about 2 p.m., Mitzi was reading the newspaper when she noticed something of interest, a preview of that day's ball game between the Pirates and the Padres. And according to the newspaper, Doc Ellis was scheduled to pitch for the Pirates. Doc, confused, thought the paper had it wrong. He was scheduled to pitch Friday, not Thursday. Mitzi informed him that it was, in fact, Friday. Stunned... <laughs> Oh my god! He immediately... <laughs> did it get dark and light again? He immediately hopped on a plane for San Diego, arriving at the stadium with barely enough time to spare. He then met a female acquaintance by the dugout who handed him a bag of Bennies, a type of amphetamine. He took these pills before stepping onto the mound. This was part of Doc's and some other players' normal game time routine, LSD or no LSD. Doc remembers thinking that he saw a comet tail behind his fastball. While that may have been an LSD hallucination, he was indeed throwing fire that the Padres could not hit. He was also incredibly wild. He recorded eight walks compared to only six strikeouts over his nine innings of work, including the beaning hit by a pitch of the Padres center fielder Ivan Murray. According to a High Times interview Ellis did in August 1987, he saw many different hallucinations during his no-hitter trip, including the great Jimi Hendrix standing in the batter's box, swinging his guitar as a bat, the baseball growing as large as a beach ball and then shrinking as small as a pea, and Richard Nixon and doing the umpire's job of calling balls and strikes. This actually sounds like it would make the game a lot more interesting! He even said at times that he couldn't see the batter and had to focus on his catcher's glove in order to not fall down. As to when the wider public became aware of these rather odd details, that wouldn't occur until four years after Doc retired, 13 years after the game itself. Naturally, from this, some speculate Doc may have been exaggerating some of the details like the Nixon and Hendricks bit. That said, at the time, Doc wasn't really for glorifying drug use, having a few years before checked himself into a drug treatment program and having been clean thereafter. On top of that, he was working as a drug counselor at the time. Given all that, most are willing to accept his story at face value, as it seems odd that he'd simply randomly invent such a story about how he was on drugs during one of the greatest moments of his career. That said, one of those who's not inclined to believe Ellis at all was Bill Christine, the pirate's beat writer for the Pittsburgh Press at the time. He stated there was no way, if Doc was as high as a Georgia Pine, Doc's description of himself, as Ellis claimed, that no one would have noticed. If a starting pitcher and a dictatorial manager, Danny Murtar, had been flaking right before a start, the paper would have known about it, Christine said in an interview with Deadspin. Of course, Ellis claimed his teammates knew he was high on something at the time, but that was hardly anything that any compatriots would leak to the press, especially not after such a momentous game. Doc Ellis went on to pitch nine more seasons in the major leagues. 1971 was by far his best year, winning 19 games with a 3.06 earned run average. He was honored as an all-star, finished fourth in the NL Cy Young voting and led his Pittsburgh Pirates to a World Series championship. After retiring from baseball, as mentioned, Ellis entered into a drug treatment program and became a drug counselor. He was even hired by the New York Yankees in 1986 to help the young players deal with their substance abuse problems. Unfortunately, hard living took its toll on Ellis when he was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver in 2007 and was placed on the list for a liver transplant. By 2008, he was suffering from heart problems as well. In the end, Ellis passed away on December the 18th, 2008, at the age of 63 in Los Angeles, California.
And now for a bonus fact. LSD, more technically known as lysergic acid dithalamide, was first synthesized on November 16, 1938, by Swiss scientist Dr. Albert Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman was working at the Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland, researching ergot alkaloid derivatives for use in pharmaceuticals. Ergot alkaloids are a type of ergoline alkaloid, which is found in a certain type of fungus. Ergoline has many medical uses, including being used in the treatment of migraines and Parkinson's disease. In synthesizing LSD, Dr. Hoffman intended to create a stimulant for the respiratory and circulatory systems. And he ended up making something a lot more intense. The fact that his creation caused psychedelic effects wasn't actually known until a full half decade later when Dr. Hoffman accidentally absorbed a small amount of the chemical through his fingertips. He described his first experience with LSD thusly. Affected by a remarkable restlessness combined with a slight dizziness. At home, I lay down and sank into a not unpleasant intoxicated-like condition characterized by an extreme extremely stimulated imagination. In a dreamlike state, with eyes closed, I found the daylight to be unpleasantly glaring, I perceived an uninterrupted stream of fantastic pictures, extraordinary shapes, with intense kaleidoscopic play of colors. After some two hours, this condition faded away. After a significant amount of further study, LSD was eventually introduced as a psychiatric drug starting in 1947. It was also later used in the 1950s by the CIA in Project MK Ultra, where, among other things, the CIA illegally gave LSD to people, including the general public, without their knowing. They then studied the effects with the point of the project to attempt to use various methods, including drugs, torture, etc., to manipulate people's brain states and functions as a way to experiment with potential mind control methods. For many of these drug tests, especially early on, there were apparently no medical personnel on hand, despite that occasionally the randomly selected subjects had significant negative side effects, sometimes needing later hospitalization. Even more troubling, some of the tests proved lethal, but that did not stop the CIA from continuing their experimentation on random U.S. citizens. One of these lives belonged to Dr. Frank Olson, himself a researcher with the U.S. Army who studied developing techniques for offensive use of biological weapons and biological research for the CIA. Along with a group of nine other such scientists, he attended a conference in a cabin at Deep Creek Lake in Maryland in November 1953. Once there, ironically, CIA operatives spiked the researchers' contro with LSD. Only after the scientists had finished their drinks were they informed that they had been drugged. Most of the researchers had handled the experience well and had no after effects. But not Dr. Olson. He never recovered from the ordeal and shortly after the experiments began to show symptoms of paranoia and schizophrenia. Dr. Olson's superior and the CIA, who ran the experiment, arranged for him to get treatment in New York City. While spending the night in a hotel room with a CIA officer and after requesting a wake-up call for the next morning, Dr. Olson somehow managed to fall to his death. As the CIA officer Lashbrook reported, at approximately 2.30 a.m. Saturday, November 28th, Lashbrook was awakened by a loud crash of glass. Olson had crashed through the closed window blinds and the closed window, and he fell to his death from the window of our room on the 10th floor. There is no indication that any investigation of foul play, particularly by the CIA officer, who was both responsible for the experiment and alone in the hotel room with Olson at the time, was ever conducted. On top of that, as noted by Senator Edward Kennedy of the whole thing, perhaps most disturbing of all was the fact that the extent of experimentation on human subjects was unknown. The records of all these activities were destroyed in 1973 at the instruction of then CIA director Richard Helms. As to how we know about some of it at least, it turns out some of the records were overlooked and then found in 1977. In any event, going back to LSD creator Dr. Hoffman, LSD wasn't the only popular hallucinogenic substance Dr. Hoffman was involved with. As director of natural products at Sandoz, he studied various other hallucinogenic substances, successfully synthesizing some of them such as psilocybin, which is the main ingredient of magic mushrooms. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out our podcast, The Brain Food Show? If you search Brain Food, one word, wherever you get your podcasts, you will find it. And thank you for watching.